Thanks for tuning in, guys. I'll be right back. I did forget to bring one of my books. Hold on one second. <laughs> Tonight's a bit of an open chat, and I am going to be talking about inpatient medical coding study tips, okay, uh, because as I had anticipated, I did get a lot of questions from folks today asking about my study tips for inpatient coding. So, <laughs> I'm going to talk about that today. Um, hi, Misty. Thank you, Blue Hearts. Uh, yes, I got such I got such a wonderful uh, messages from everybody from yesterday because uh, if you don't know yet, I passed my CCS exam, uh, so I'm very excited about that. Very excited to share that with all of you. And um, it's when you think about taking this exam, or if you're going to take the CIC, which is the inpatient coding exam for AAPC, it is. A lot to think about because inpatient coding is such a huge difference from outpatient coding. Two completely different mindsets you have to have. And of course the, the uh, procedure book is going to be completely different too. So I'm going to talk about some of my tips and my strategies for what I did as far as like studying on the inpatient side because that is admittedly not my strong suit <laughs> because I have spent my entire career on the outpatient side. So. This was learning and independently learning um, more of the inpatient stuff. So um, let's go ahead and get into it. If you are brand new to my channel, welcome. I am Blue. I'm a medical coder. Tonight I am talking about inpatient medical coding study tips. If you are looking to sit for the CCS exam, the Certified Coding Specialist exam, and that is offered with the American Health Information Management Association or the Certified Coding Associate exam, uh, which also covers inpatient medical coding, uh, or if you are sitting for AAPC, the American Academy of Professional Coders Certified Inpatient Coder Credential, tonight's episode is for you. I am going to be discussing my tips on what I did to study for the inpatient side because, as I mentioned, <laughs> um, inpatient coding is new for me. Uh, new for me in that I have not had hands-on experience like in a clinic with it. I've done profi coding which is still outpatient coding, even though the patient is staying in the hospital. But what do you do when the patient is staying in the hospital? And what does this coding, what is this coding for? This coding is for the facility. When you are coding those inpatient procedures, you're making sure that the facility is getting paid versus on the outpatient side where we are ensuring that the provider and their services get paid for. So <laughs> again, two completely different mindsets. Um, so hi Misty, hi Loon. Loon says, uh, I'm in my third year of study. <laughs> How are you doing? I'm doing great. Uh, hi Patrice, thank you for all the blue hearts. Hi Byron, thank you for joining me. Hi Gigi, thank you. <laughs> um, BK, hi, how are you? Uh, in STEMI. Are you talking about that you're studying in STEMI? <laughs> uh, so anyway, Working with a PCS manual, you are going to be making sure that you understand approaches. The only way to do that is to actually get in the book. Now, uh, this is not an ad for Optin 360 coding, but these are the books that I use. I use this particular book. 
Um, this is the ICD-10 PCS. This, this, of course, is a 2021 edition. Uh, but the thing I like about Optum360 coding books, in particular their PCS book, is that they have actually a whole section in the back that has a whole list of all these um, ICD-10 PCS coding questions, right? Just it's procedure questions, like what is the procedure code for this? All listed in the back of this book along with the answers. That is what I did. I worked through all of those all of those questions, all of those procedures, I looked them all up. Did I uh, answer them all correctly? No, because it's a matter of learning. But I did get better towards the end part when I started to understand what was actually happening. Uh, the approaches and the intent is what used to throw me. Uh, I never understood the difference between removal and removal, removal in the CPT book is something completely different. Removal in um, ICD-10 PCS is different. It is not removal. It is different when you think of why they're doing it. So when we think of removal of an appendix, okay, in uh, the CPT, we're looking up uh, appendectomy, right? Appendix, right? Taking it out. In here, <laughs> it is a resection when you're thinking of taking it out. So again, it changes on those words. It's not removal, it's resection. So there's a lot of different things that you have to learn when you're under trying to understand the language. I do recommend reading the ICD-10 PCS guidelines as well. Uh, I posted those many times and when I update this video, the uh, video uh, description box, I will make sure that I try to find those. Uh, and, and leave the link for that so that way you guys can go over that. Yes, excision and extraction get me sometimes, says Carissa. Yes, and that was a problem that I did have too. Extirpation was the one that really got me. And it wasn't until I started seeing like, okay, extirpation of a blood clot. And I'm like, then it started to click because I started to think, okay, well, all right, how, how would I, how would I think of this? How would I think of this together? Was it blood clot? Or was it like um, mass or something? It was something that they had to go in and get it out. But I think it was a blood clot and they used extirpation. So I was like, hmm, okay. <laughs> uh, and I would have never have thought of that. I would have thought of something, you know, something completely different from that. But uh, it is understanding those words. And, and when you get to that, then you're like, oh, okay. But I will say the approaches is important for you to understand. In the back of this book, there are um, also like definitions of the approaches and they give you examples of those approaches. And you need to really kind of think about what this means. Like if they're doing a, a laparoscopic surgery, right? That would be uh, percutaneous, endoscopic and that kind of thing. So <laughs> you need to think about what's actually going on. If they're going through an orifice, a natural orifice, that is that was that would be completely different um, on the approach. So it really does help when you understand the procedures themselves. The one I did not struggle with was the um, musculoskeletal procedures. That one I did not struggle with uh, when it came to any of that because I understand that I've watched those um, those those surgeries many times online. <laughs> So I get how I was like, okay, well, I know that one's going to be this way and that one's going to be this way and that one's going to be, I knew that, okay, because like I said, I've done that for many years where I've just watched the um, procedures and when you watch the procedures, you, you know, and you understand this colonoscopy, that is another one where he's like, okay, that is a natural orifice, um, endoscopy, again, natural orifice. And so that is what you really have to understand when you're looking at these things. Um, the body part key, the body part key is letting you know that again, you may see the documentation documented one way, but according to the book, this, that word is equivalent to another word that's in this book. So it does have the body part key and it will say to, um, when you see this word code to this. So it may be just the location. It may be a generalized location type deal or it may be more specific. So that way you can look in the back and make sure that you get familiar with those. The appendixes 
are really valuable when it comes to learning anything. But most importantly, when I was learning um, the inpatient coding on that side of the house, oh yeah, the, those appendixes were where I lived <laughs> for months. I lived in those. Hi, Nayeli. <laughs> Thank you for joining me. Uh, but yes, that is where I paid attention. I did flashcards for those. I did uh, some worksheets on my Patreon for those as well. I did a inpatient coding boot camp with HC Pro, and that was back in February. Um, it was a three months that I was with it. Um, was it three months or, or 60 days? I'm not really sure. I can't remember anymore. <laughs> uh, but anyway, it was it was in February I had started it. And trying to get through that and really kind of understanding, I liked it, uh, but I will say that the program is expensive. So if you're paying for it out of pocket, um, because sometimes people want to go back through a, a whole program. I really do think that if you know some and you have some foundation of inpatient coding that the boot camp may help you again it is expensive so you're going to have to come up with that you know justification for yourself if you want to spend that kind of money but i will say that if you do continue to study on your own you will do just fine um versus having to pay out all that money because it's going to be self-paced again and it is going to give you a lot of the broad strokes uh, that program was good at, at some of some of the things that I did not know and did not understand about inpatient coding. Uh, but again, I mean, it's entirely up to you. It is quite hefty on the price. <laughs> uh, I, I I would still recommend it, but again, it is a little. So anyway, um, but that was what I was working through those um, those problems in the back and checking my answers and the ones that I did not understand at all, which is a lot of the heart procedures. I, di I, di I don't get them. <laughs> and trying to get that and trying to understand how they got to that, the only way that I was able to teach myself that, get some sort of grasp of what was happening versus not knowing at all, was uh, looking at the question, looking at the answer, going through and working it out how did they get to that that kind of helped me to kind of get on the right track because it didn't make sense trying to stick with something that I didn't really know and trying to figure it out on my own. that's the worst thing that you can do is frustrate yourself is when you don't understand something and you're trying to figure it out go ahead and look at the answer for that particular question and then go through the thought process of how they went to it and how they got there and make notes that was how i started to catch on about the resection versus excision versus removal uh because i started to see total when i started to see total uh removal of total removal of okay that was my trigger word for resection because they're taking it out it's it's not going to go in there again and they're not taking part of it they're literally taking it out so i'm like okay that was how i was able to correlate those and i wrote that down on my notepad and so what I would do is I would cover the answer. I would work through the through the question and then I would go and I would um, uncover it and see if I did it. <laughs> and when I did, I was like, OK, cool. When I didn't, I crossed the line through it and then I wrote the correct answer and then I went back and looked. And the more I started doing that, I noticed I started doing it a lot in the beginning because I didn't know how. Right. I didn't know how to get through it. Um, but when it got towards the end of me doing it, I started doing that less and less. And I was like, oh, okay. Uh, and sometimes it was because I was tired and I didn't see the approach. And I'm like, that was stupid. Because <laughs> I would code it as an open instead of a percutaneous or whatever. And I was like, that was really stupid. And then I would know it was time for me to stop. So I always try to make my study times. That's another thing too, you guys. You got to make your study times palatable. Don't go past an hour. That was what I noticed. If I if I went past an hour, I did start to feel the drag. Sometimes I'd go to an hour and a half and I would stop after that because then at an hour and a half, I'm tired, you know. Uh, but an hour was really great. I would I would work through the book for an hour and then I would stop and I'd come on here and I'd do something for Patreon or I'd answer some emails or I'd be doing something else. And then I'd come back and I'd work another hour and I would take like 30 minute breaks. Sometimes it was another hour break and then I would go back to studying. And that was how I had been spending my evenings is doing stuff like that. 
but I always gave myself a break right around that one hour mark because that was where I was like, okay, I was able to keep absorbing it without burning myself out. When you're studying, you don't want to burn out. That's the worst thing that you can do. And for, for somebody who studies a lot, I, I get it, <laughs> but you cannot, you cannot burn yourself out when it comes to those things. And on the days when I felt tired from work or I felt that I had a long day, I'm like, okay, then I'll just take tonight off and tomorrow morning I'll pick it up or tomorrow afternoon I'll pick it up. And that's what I did. Uh, so that helped me. Um, some of the other things that I used, another one, and I know you guys have seen this, <laughs> you've been watching this uh, past couple of weeks. This book I love, okay? This is a book that there are scenarios in here. This book really did help to break down a lot of what is happening in the inpatient side. If you don't have experience working on the inpatient side, this book is going to be your best friend. Now, this book has the answers in it. And as you work through this book, it does give you scenarios and it does give you the answers. So the answers will be in a different color and then the question will be in one color. So what I would do, cover up the answers, work through that, and then look and see if I did it right. And it will explain in here how they got to it. So that is one of the things that I really love. This is the American Hospital Association, um, ICD-10 CM and ICD-10 PCS uh, coding handbook. And this one happens to be from 2021, uh, not 2021, 2019. Now, a lot of people will ask me, Blue, is it okay to use a previous year um, book like that to study with? Absolutely. Um, there's going to be some codes though that may have been updated and if they're updated that's okay because you're going to know um, that it was an updated code if you see <laughs> uh, because it'll tell you what the what the code should be and if you see the code doesn't match but it's the same description in your book then you're going to know that that code was updated. So it is okay to work with these older books. There's a lot of really good information that's still there and so as long as you stay current with your guidelines, which there's brand new guidelines that come out every single year, and they're always downloadable and free on the CMS website, cms.gov. And uh, I did put the link <laughs> to that in the independent study video. Uh, I did update to the 2022, so that way you can review that as well. So uh, using these books and going through these, working through the um, word problems that are in the back, they do have uh, those, and they're broken down by specialty. They have inpatient, and they have ER uh, scenarios in here as well. So they have a lot of really good scenarios. I'm trying to think of what it's called. I can't think of what it's called. <laughs> uh, what is the name of this section? So it's a case summary exercises. Again, this is the book to use when you're studying. Okay, This is what I recommend. And again, a lot of people were asking me what, what books did I use? Uh, a lot of this you can Google on your own as well. I'm sure that those are not the only books <laughs> that are out there. Um, and they're not. Uh, I also use the Applying the ICD-10 PCS uh, Coding Guidelines book from Optum360. So that's another really good book about explaining. I read that book cover to cover. And that is something that you have to do if you really want to understand what you're doing and you have no experience, your best line of defense is to read. <laughs> um, BK, that's true. Being able to know when and how long to study is very important. Hi, Mitney, I'm doing great. So that is something that you have to keep yourself on a schedule to be able to do that and give yourself that downtime in between uh, when you're taking those breaks. If you take a nap, you take a nap. <laughs> if you're gonna take care of something, Go ahead and take care of it. But no one can make this a priority but you. Okay. And so you need to make sure that you remember that it is a marathon. It is not a sprint. The time that you're in school and the time that you're studying is literally a marathon. So from the time that I took and passed my CCSP, I already had it planned that I was going to um, take the CCS. I knew I was going to take it. I just did not know when, uh, but I knew I had it already planned that I was going to take it. So I said, okay, <laughs> I need to get a lot stronger than what I feel right now uh, because I had taken the, um, the 
I uh, the um, inpatient coding bootcamp from January to March is when I finished it. So I, it was 60 days. It was 60 days, not 90. Because <laughs> um, it's a boot camp. It's 60 days. So uh, I had finished it. And I said, okay, I still don't feel... I feel a little bit more knowledgeable, but I did not feel as strong. And I said, okay, this is something I'm going to have to buckle down on and really focus if this is what I want. Well, then March came and that's when I went ahead and took my CCSP. And I was like, okay, I got this. <laughs> um, so the rest of this time is going to be that I'm going to have to study up really hard on the inpatient stuff because while I know my way around, I'm not as confident and I wanted to get more confident than I was. So, um, BK says when going through nursing school, I worked 40 to 60 hours in the night shift. Plus I went to nursing school full time too. And it was very rough. I spent most of my time at school. I used to study for hours at night till four to five in the morning and see it's it really all depends on you it depends on what what your home life is like what your home situation is uh, because that plays a big part of it for some people they get very overwhelmed and they get discouraged and they think well i don't have all that time because i have a family uh, but there are still people who still manage to make it work even with a family and even with small children even with teenagers <laughs> so that is uh, what they do. It really all depends on you. If you have the drive to be able to, oh, idiot, get out of here, troll. Where is it? Thank you. <sighs> Come on. Oh, and now you're just going to, okay. I got that unwanted. There we go. Reported. Bye bye. Idiots. All right. But I noticed that I was not retaining much. So I had to readjust my study habits. And sometimes you have to do that. You know, sometimes you, you have to do that. So. I don't like spammers and I don't like trolls. <laughs> I don't think anybody does, but whatever. <laughs> so, but yes, sometimes when people get really focused and really driven in it, they can literally burn themselves out really quick when they know that they're not retaining it. It's not giving them joy. It's not, you know, it's not making them happy to study because it's just becoming a chore to them. You don't ever want it to become a chore. And my thing with studying and and working through those um, questions in the ICD-10 PCS book in the back <laughs> uh, was that every single time I got a procedure correct, I was like, okay, I got this. I got this. This is good. This is good. Uh, because I knew I was grasping after a while. And then when I started to, to get like that, I was like, okay, um, then I can work through this whole sheet or whatever and then take a break. And that's what I would do the faster I got because – as I started to understand what I was doing, I started to work on, okay, I need to get faster. And when you're taking any, either test, whether you're taking uh, the CCA, the CCS, or even the CIC, it is all about timing because these, these exams are timed. All these exams for medical coding are timed. So you really want to make sure that you're watching how fast you're getting through that book. The more familiar you are with the book, the better off you're going to be. And I've um, mentioned to you guys to actually go through your book page by page by page by page. And when you do that, uh, it gets you familiar. You don't have to read everything, but it does make you familiar with where things are in the book, whether it is in the appendixes or whether it is in the front with the guidelines. Um, reading those guidelines every week, and that's what I did is read those guidelines because Again, when you understand the guidelines, then you're going to understand how to code. When you understand how to code, <laughs> then you're really good. So that is something that will help you if you're out there. Um, but yeah, flipping through the book, getting familiar with that book, so that way you can get through it quicker is a lot easier than, excuse me, taking the time to tab the books. Don't tab your books because that shows that you're not using the books enough. People who do not have tabs on their books are people who use their books constantly. If you have tabs on your books, they get snagged and the pages tear 
And by the time you know it, your book looks all ratty. It doesn't need to look ratty uh, because it already has all the answers. If you're flipping through the book like you're supposed to, you'll be so familiar with it, those tabs will get in your way. So if you are still in the brand new process of studying, don't get used to those tabs. Don't listen to other people when they tell you, oh yeah, you need a tab. Again, I see clutter. A lot of times when I see students and their books, there's clutter all over it. And then they feel overwhelmed looking at this cluttery book. The book already has the answers. You don't need to add anything to it. Okay. So um, that's my advice on that one. <laughs> the other thing I want to talk about tonight is modifiers. Modifiers are that little known kind of annoying sometimes, but they do tell a lot of the story. Now for Christmas Blockmas, not Christmas in July. I said Christmas in July last time. <laughs> For Vlogmas this year, I will be doing a breakdown of the modifiers. Now, I already have them broken down. Um, I'm not going to do all of them, obviously, because there's so many of them. Uh, but I will be talking about the most popular ones. And then I will be talking about a combination of them. So that is what I'm going to be doing uh, for next month, <laughs> starting on December the 1st. But that I will tell you guys, when you invest in really understanding your modifiers and when to apply them and what procedures do these fall under, um, like some, some uh, modifiers only go on ENM and some only go on certain procedure codes and some only go on other <laughs> procedure codes, but you got to make sure that you understand what ones and where. So I did get this book, Understanding Modifiers, again, from Optum360, not an ad for Optum. <laughs> uh, but this book does explain a lot of how um, these modifiers work, examples of when to use them and that kind of thing. So this does help. Uh, there's also the appendix of the CPT manual, okay, uh, that will help you. Now, I know this has nothing to do with um, inpatient coding, but it was just an aside that I thought I would go ahead and bring up as well because mm -hmm. you got to keep it interesting. <laughs> uh, but it is about the details, guys. I will say that. <laughs> so, does anybody have anything while I'm still here? So, how long are you guys studying for? We should talk about that. What does your um, your schedule of studying look like? I'm trying to get rid of those stupid messages from that spammer. <laughs> Three hours a day, weekends off. Okay, uh, that works, you know, that works. Are you doing it all in one sitting or are you doing it, breaking it up? And for some people, it's just the opposite. <laughs> they'll work on the weekends uh, studying and then the weekdays they'll have off. So they really, you know, it, it no, 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 one size does not feel that fit all in the situation. It really all depends on how it works for you. Uh, Misty says, my goal is to sit for the CCA exam in March or April. That's great. You have plenty of time. <laughs> uh, plenty of time to go over and review your um, inpatient and your outpatient coding. Markeisha, breaking it up because my head starts to get overwhelmed. Well, that's good. At least you know your limits. You know, sometimes when people don't know their limits, that's what hurts them, you know, in the end is that they don't, they didn't know their limits. And for some people, they, they get overwhelmed because they think they need to do a bunch of things all at one time. But when you stop and you start to do one thing at a time, it does make things a lot more easier. Um, and you can handle a lot more when you take one task on at a time. Uh, BK says, I want to start a program next year, but for sure, I want to review my medical terms, anatomy, and pathophysiology and physiology well that's really good because that is something that you do have to get a refresher on um and having that background already from having gone to nursing school that will help that will help 
uh, tremendously, I think. <laughs> Misty, I'm working my program as if I'm working a normal job with lots of overtime too. <laughs> that that works uh, because sometimes if you're not working, that should be your, your full-time job. People have asked me before, how, how many hours to a week do I recommend? They're like, well, Blue, I work a full-time job. I can't be, you know, doing all these hours. Okay, but you can do 20 hours. Well, no, no, that's too much. Well, not when you break it up. You know, two hours each day during the week, five hours on Saturday, five hours on Sunday, and you're good to go. And by the time you know it, that time will have already flown by, and that's 20 hours you've you've invested. Well, no, I think I can only do 10. Okay, the less time you do, the more you're setting yourself up to fail, okay? Because you're going to try to cram in a bunch of things all at one time. And when you have a lot to learn, you do have to pace yourself and pace it out, right? <laughs> Um, Mitney, I don't know if you said this already, but how many hours a day is jinx? <laughs> Markeisha, thank God I had all of those courses in nursing school, so I'm pretty good at AMP and path though. Uh, BK, it's been a while, so I gotta dust off some of the webs. <laughs> yes, but it's, it's only gonna benefit you, you know, when you think about it, uh, and being strategic about it, being strategic. So... For me, when, um, you know, going through that um, inpatient coding boot camp and being done with it in the spring, going through the summer and working, making my way <laughs> through that uh, procedure side on in the ICD-10 PCS book, that was where I was like, okay, now this is really getting real. This is real now. <laughs> and when I scheduled my exam for the CCS, it was like literally one day I was like, okay, it's, it's time. Because I was ready and I was like, you know, this is, it's now or never, <laughs> you know, essentially. So it's like, okay. Uh, so we all go through it. We all go through that moment of, well, you know, uh, and it wasn't long after I had scheduled it. So, um, because you, you get a certain amount of time, you get 90 days to be able to take your exam. And it was just, it was pretty, pretty well right away. I'll be, you know, I just looked at the date that I wanted and then, okay, there it was. <laughs> and here I am. <laughs> uh, Barkeisha laughs, uh, but it was so nice because I got my, um, my certificate. So I had went to Walmart yesterday and I got the two new frames, right? Uh, because I wanted one for the CCS and then one for the CCSP so I can hang them in my office. <laughs> the CCSP already has its own pretty frame, but I was like, okay, I want a, a matching frame for, for the two. So I have them <laughs> and they're already up. In the office. I was so excited. <laughs> uh, BK says, it's been proven that cramming uh, for most does not work. And the retention is not there for long-term memory. That is true. So the night before, obviously, I didn't study. Because I was like, okay, I, I've i gone through those procedures so many times uh, with the PCS book. I'm, I'm pretty well set on the inpatient side. But for the PCS, um, I was like, okay, I'm... I have went through majority of those things that when I when I had gone through those and I found the ones that I was not strong in and I did the reverse <laughs> self-teaching, then I was like, okay, I had gone through those plenty of times and I had gotten where I was able to get to the right path enough that I was like, all right, it's time. <laughs> um, Misty. Blue, how long do you recommend working as a CCA before studying for the CCS? Two years. Two. They recommend one, but I recommend two uh, because of the simple fact that from what I remember of the CCA, while it was very difficult, the CCS, it, it was like um, Mike Tyson and Evander Holyfield the whole time that's exactly what it was like now i don't know which one i can't remember anymore who won between evander holyfield and, and mike tyson i won't remember anymore but what i remember of of the cca was literally it was tough the cca was very hard but what i remember versus what i know now of the ccs whoo the ccs is a very humbling exam it is very humbling. Now, I did pretty good. I scored pretty good. I'll give myself that. But at the same time, it was just like, 
you know, you're, you're, it's like literally like you're in a heavyweight fight because you're having to use all cylinders. You're having to think and you're having to be quick on your feet because that clock is going, that clock is going. So, um, while you do really well as a CCA and you're working and you really kind of understanding it, you have to make sure that your quickness is there because you have four hours to complete this exam. Now, keep this in mind, keep this in mind. Um, with the CCA, right? It's a two hour exam. I remember almost going to, to right to the end. I think I only had a few minutes left. I don't remember how much time I had left, but I think it was probably less than 10 on the CCS. I had eight minutes left on the clock. So I literally went three hours, 52 minutes, three hours and 52 minutes for the CCS versus, um, what I did on the CCSP, CCSP, I had an hour and 10 minutes, 20 minutes left over still to go. And I, I, I had all that time and I was just like, well, you know, but I flew through the CCSP. So that's why I recommend working two years before you try to go. Um, again, it, it, they, they recommend a year um, that you've been working as a CCA. If you're going to try to sit for the CCSP, I recommend um, two years, to be honest with you, because I know how hard it is <laughs> going through it. Oh yeah. I have, my feet have felt that fire. So trust me, I know. And that is uh, something that you need to be ready for everything, everything, everything. <laughs> um, Missy says, okay, thank you. Thank you for the blue hearts. BK, I read several studies that showed that studying for longer than one hour at a time has not been beneficial. For a while, the brain starts to get foggy as it has, it is best to get frequent breaks in um, between to give your brain time to absorb everything. Yeah, that's why I said I, I really didn't try to go past an hour. Occasionally, I did get um, sometimes where I went an hour and a half and it was only because I was really kind of focus on what I was doing and I didn't want to stop, you know, especially when you're going through these case studies and you're trying to read and really kind of understand. So I was just like, okay, I'll be okay on this one. Um, but when I was working through the problems and I was like, okay, an hour, I need to stop, you know, and then I just eat or take a break or walk around or go do something, um, or watch funny videos <laughs> on YouTube. Uh, but that's that's what I did. I watched um, I'm a I'm a survivor, um, Animal Sanctuary and Donkey Farm. That channel, oh my gosh, I have been so hooked on that channel since uh, the summer. All the farm animals on that channel are hysterical. They are hysterical, and they're just naturally themselves. There's just something relaxing and calming about watching animals and just in their natural. It just being themselves, you know, and it's, it's just funny in the commentary. And there's Moo, who is this huge uh, cow. He's, oh, I love Moo. Moo is probably my favorite because he's just huge. He's six foot one. And for a cow, that is huge. I mean, you can tell when you look at him, he's, he's huge. And even the the, um, the guy that runs it, Lester, and, and Lester is a pretty tall guy. He's like six foot. And so this cow is like right there <laughs> with him and he's just a happy, happy cow. He's just, you know, eating and he trots along. And then there's pig Trudy. There's a pig. She's a feral hog, but, um, uh, uh, like they, they found her and, um, the mother had been hit by a car and had, you know, well, so then all the other piglets had gone away. Well, pig Trudy was the only one left. So Lester ended up getting her. And she is just a diva. She's not like those other feral hogs that you see. She's just this, she's like domesticated, you know? <laughs> but I don't know, it was cute. But that helped me. So whenever I would take a break, I would watch those uh, videos and just laugh hysterically and then just, you know, get back to studying and then take a break and watch Lester and the Animals, <laughs> you know? Um, hi, Rita. But yes, uh, that's what I did uh, for that. Yes, Misty, it is really cute. And they have an ostrich too. So uh, this ostrich is named Carl. And Carl was is so sweet in the beginning. And then 
like I guess as he's there, he's more protective over the small animals. And so he hisses at Lester and, you know, it's just, it's funny to watch, you know, and Lester is so patient with all the animals and they have all these donkeys and goats and those little goats. I never knew how mischievous goats were until I started watching the channel because goats, <laughs> they're crazy. And then they're always running around and and it's funny <laughs> but yes it's it's what i did to relax so yeah i'm a survivor uh animal animal sanctuary and donkey farm or do, is a donkey farm and animal sanctuary yeah but it's it's really a good channel i really like to watch it it's fun uh hi Yvette. thank you for the blue heart <laughs> uh, but that's what i did and that's what i recommend um, if you're not understanding something, reach out to a mentor. That is one of the things that I will recommend is if it's not absolutely clicking for you or you feel like maybe you need somebody else to explain it to you. If your teacher's not explaining it to you, find a mentor first. Uh, somebody with the association. If you can't find somebody with the association, I recommend getting a tutor. Um, there's a ton of tutors on LinkedIn. I'm also a tutor myself. Uh, so it's it's worth it when you don't understand to actually invest a little bit in yourself to to better understand because it is difficult learning stuff out of a book and that is the majority of what we do all the time is learn from books and sometimes if you have if you can find somebody who can explain it to you that's great but then you know sometimes it's just better if you just hire a tutor and be like okay can you explain this because I don't get it <laughs> and I mean it's usually um, and, and, and the instances that I have found, it's usually been a pretty easy explanation for me to be able to explain at least uh, when I've been able to help those who um, have tutoring with me. So, uh, but that is what I recommend when it comes to uh, studying. Okay. Don't get frustrated with it and just quit it just because you didn't get it. And a lot of people will try to do that and they say, well, no, they said this was supposed to be easy. They're going to tell you that because they want to sell the program. <laughs> They're not going to tell you how hard it is. Uh, that would be a terrible salesman. <laughs> uh, but B-L-E-U, Hatsu. B-L-E-U is my name. Not B-L-U-E. Not the color. Not B-A-L-O-O, -O, like Baloo the Bear. It's B-L-E-U. Um, and thank you. Uh, Misty, yes, my late grandmother bent over one day and the, her goat actually... <laughs> bit uh bit i guess a locker of her hair out of her head and her hair never grew back on the spot rest her soul poor thing <laughs> well spell check okay uh Ritha, how can i study for my cca exam i mean what is the best way to study i started talking about that at the beginning of this video Excuse the slang words, but true story. You know, and I've heard, you know, those goats, they, they can be quite aggressive, you know, <laughs> uh, when they are, when it's feeding time, I've heard of them breaking bones before. I've actually, because, you know, I code for ortho and I've, I've had a few uh, fractures where the person was rammed by a goat. And on, um, on that channel that I watch, there's a, a billy goat named Ringo. Now, Ringo is a, a billy goat, and er, Ringo eats before everybody else does. And he will ram other animals uh, before they try to get food if he's not done with his, if, if he's not done with food. And they put out lots of different food piles, but if he wants that food pile and there's other animals that try to get to it, oh no, he's not having it. He will, he will headbutt them and, <laughs> and shoo them out of the way before he... Uh, can get, you know, before he gets run off from that food bowl. So, you know, <laughs> or that food pile rather. But yeah, they are quite, uh, they are quite feisty. So, yeah. Uh, I have lots of videos on study tips tonight when I just happen to be talking about studying for the inpatient side. Um, and please be sure to go through the videos if you're interested in, in finding out any more tips. I get a lot of basic questions like that when there are tons of videos on my channel. I, I post five nights a week at 7.30 p.m. Central Standard Time. Yes, the last couple of nights I've been a little late. <laughs> uh, but this week is an unusual week. Let's just, let's just be real about that. Let's be real about that. This is an unusual week this week, for me at least. And so, <laughs> uh, for the most 
part, I am here at 7.30 p.m. Central Standard Time. And like I said, new shows uh, every weeknight. And on the weekends, of course, I don't have shows, but um, there is Vlogmas coming up. So you guys will be getting 25 days of shows <laughs> plus uh, all the weekday shows. So y'all are going to get plenty of shows <laughs> in December. December and July are my two craziest months on YouTube because that... Those are the months that I put out more content because it is Christmas in July and it is uh, Vlogmas. And you have to be putting out videos. You got to be putting out content. So I always try to make the the topics of Vlogmas or the topics of, of Christmas in July interesting enough to keep you guys coming back for more. <laughs> because it's a lot to learn. It's a lot to learn. And I, and I give you guys my tips. I don't do a whole lot of breakdowns because the uh, of like the coding stuff because I have before and there's literally no engagement, no response. People do not watch. And so I'm not going to give you guys stuff that y'all don't watch. And people will tell me, oh, yeah, Blue, we promise. And then nobody watches. And I, it takes so much time to put together that content. That's why I insist now on putting a lot of that content on Patreon. I will talk about things in, in passing. I will explain things, obviously, because if you look through my videos, my most recent ones, there's a lot of those. Uh, but I put a lot of that content on Patreon because those folks are actually paying to support me. So I think that I can use a lot of my own personal time to be able to break this stuff down to them because that is what they're there for. <laughs> um, Barkisha, new subscriber. <laughs> uh, BK. That's why I don't have farm animals. Too scary. I love my dogs. Oh, I love dogs too. Uh, Missy, how exciting. You know, thank you for the blue hearts. Uh, BK, that is awesome. More the merrier. Your videos actually help us. <laughs> I'm so glad. <laughs> uh, yes, farm animals can be very dangerous. Um, Moo has run Lester into the fence quite a few times. Moo has also chased Lester's nephew, and, and he has his own channel, and I watch his channel too. His name is um, Shirtless Jake. Uh, well, his name is Jake, but they call him Shirtless Jake because he doesn't wear, he's on the farm, so he doesn't have to wear a shirt. Uh, but he's just this young kid, and he's just so funny how he acts, and um, he was out there feeding. He was helping Lester, so he had the feed buckets. Well, then, it's so funny to see this I don't know how much uh, Moo weighs, probably 2,000 pounds, I don't know, <laughs> chasing. He's like literally trotting because Jake wouldn't put the feet down. He's like, oh my God, he's running with the feet buckets. I know this is supposed to be about study tips, y'all, but <laughs> I just watched that video and I was in tears laughing because, and that's what the show does. You know, it relaxes you. You don't think about anything, but all you can see is this, this, 2,000 pound cow chasing, <laughs> chasing this guy who's running with buckets and all you hear is Lester in the back screaming, put down the feet, Jay, put down the feet. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> but if you ever have a chance to check out that channel, it is hysterical. I love that channel. <laughs> I'm making myself laugh now. Um, thank you, Misty, for that, <laughs> for agreeing. Uh, sometimes we, we have, we just have to laugh blue and that channel is so good for that. And I actually talk about that channel a lot at work and I didn't realize how much I talked about it until my friend Linda was like, well, what did, um, what did old Lester do? What did, what did Moo do? <laughs> and then I said, I don't really talk about it that much. Do I Linda? She goes, mm hmm. but she, she'll ask me and I will tell her stories about the farm, you know, so. But it's so cute. Then Pig Trudy, when Pig Trudy first came to live with them, it was so cute. Her story, how she was getting along with the other animals and, and they wouldn't play with her. Some of the other animals wouldn't play with her. So Pebbles is a um, goat and Pebbles would play with her. And so Pebbles had a brother named Bam Bam, but um, Bam Bam died. So, uh, but they, but they hung out together. But Pebbles is just as aggressive as, as Pig Trudy. Because Pig Trudy, um, if she sees Lester with the other 
playing with the other pigs, like um, Tiny Tim, which is a huge potbelly pig, um, uh, a pig Trudy will go over there and kind of nip at him, and they'll start fighting with each other because she gets jealous. But it's it's hysterical. It is so cute. It's a really cute channel. <laughs> but anyway, so you have to find your your bits of joy when you're studying where you can. Okay. Uh, because it does help you to stay motivated because I would tell myself, okay, I can, I can watch another video uh, in between on a break because some of the videos are short, like 15 minutes and some of them are like a little bit longer and a little bit longer ones, like when they're opening up gifts, because they send, they send like people will send um, their animals like cookies and crackers and things like that. So uh, I'll, I'll be like doing stuff around the house and just listening to the things that they, they say and and that's what I do <laughs> on those things. So, uh, but yeah, I will do that and and then come back to good old studying. And it's a nice break in between because it is something that I don't have to think about because we have a, a very intellectual job as medical coders. It is, it is our career field. It is what we do. And when you think constantly, you do have to have that outlet of something that is something that you don't have to think about at all. And before, for me, it was watching like Jersey Shore because even though it's it's an older show now, <laughs> they already have kids. Uh, but it watching those shows <laughs> from that time, it's just it it's so mindless, and you don't have to think when you watch it. And so it was funny, and some of it was a little crude humor, but it was just like hmm, you know. But you just watch the show because they're they're young people, and and around that time, I was just like, okay, that's that's kind of funny, you know, when they were in Italy. And but again, I didn't have to think; I could just zone out and watch a show, versus what I do all day, which is think. Yeah. <laughs> yes, it does. It does. Uh, when you when you laugh. It, it releases that happy endorphins and, and that's why I always try to make people laugh. I always try to find things that are funny and I look for the humor in things. Uh, sometimes that's, that's not always the case. <laughs> I know some things are very serious and I know when to be serious, but uh, in those times when you can have a good laugh and it's not so stressful, oh yeah, that's the best thing. <laughs> Especially when you study, that's that's the thing that you you have to be able to find that outlet and for some people it's like they get into that they get sucked in and they forget to walk around they forget to eat they forget to uh take a break <laughs> and it just becomes so overwhelming that they ended up hating it you know and i never want people to hate it because i am i love it so much when i go to work and i see some of these records like when i when i code some of these things and I see the doctors, how they get so specific now when I tell them, when I, when I give somebody a shout out, one of the doctors a shout out, and I say, you know, so-and-so did a really good documentation on this type of case. You know, I never talk about PHI, but I do give a general story of what happened. And so never identifying you know, anybody or anything like that. You know, you don't even know if it's male or female, you know, and they're like, wow, you know, I didn't know you did all that. <laughs> Or, and they and they they tell you know their their peers and they're like I didn't know you were that well then now they're competing against each other and so now the documentation gets better and it gets more interesting to read so you know that is a, a side benefit of doing something like that but when you see things like that happen on the farm there was one that the patient was struck by a hoofed stock hoofed livestock and that was the code <laughs> uh, because it, it it's not it's not funny obviously that they got hit. You know, but they that they were around an animal and that's what happened to them. And that was how they broke their bone. And so it's just like, you see, and they go, there was actually a code for that. I'm like, yeah, there is a code for that. You know, they're like, wow. <laughs> but, you know, uh, 50 says, I'm sold. Thanks for introducing us to Lexter and Pebbles. Yes, I love them. They are they are so funny. And oh, the geese. The geese, they, he calls them flight school. The geese do not like Lester. They, they're they more Jamie. Jamie is his wife, but they're her animals, right? Because uh, she loves feathered babies. She likes ducks and she likes geese and she likes the chickens and, and the rooster. And um, their rooster is named Cornholio. And uh, <laughs> I know all these names, right? But they try, they say they try to give them people names because it gives them more of like, 
personality, they think. And so they have four goats um, with the golden girls. They call them the golden girls. So there's Rose, Dorothy, Blanche, and Sophia. And so they all have their own little personalities, but the the, the geese, they don't like Lester. <laughs> well, I shouldn't say they don't like him, but they always like, they're always honking at him, trying to, trying to nip at him, you know, but <laughs> I could talk about that show, y'all. I can because, and, and Linda makes fun of me because she says, you know, all the animals blue. I, I know them by their name, some of them, but some of the goats, I don't know. Like I hear them say that this is, oh, that's, that's so-and-so, but like some of the goats, they look almost the same to me. So I really can't tell <laughs> the difference. Uh, but, and even with the geese, I can't tell who's who with the geese, but, um, uh, Jamie says you could tell by their feet because they have different spots on their feet and some on their face. So that's how she's able to, to, uh, distinguish what duck is, is what goose is what, you know? So, <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> uh, but yes, that, that I will do. I will watch those shows. Um, and theirs is the only channel that I watch like that, you know, and, they all have their own separate view. So Jamie has her own channel. Lester has the main channel and shirtless Jake has his channel. And then, um, Lester's dad actually has his own channel, Paw Paw, hanging with Paw Paw. And so he has his own side that he does with his farm. So yeah, it gets really, <laughs> uh, Sarah, hello, blue ICD 10. Uh, w5522 XA struck by a cow initial encounter. <laughs> yes, yes, struck by a cow. Sometimes you'll have um, that if there's something specific like struck by. Sometimes it'll be contact. Like if a dog knocks somebody over, it's it comes up to contact with a dog. Or um, if it's a cat, contact with a cat, you know. So... <laughs> Um, my favorite one, of course, is the one with the dolphin, but uh, I, being in Texas, in the central part of Texas, I would not see uh, struck by a dolphin very much. <laughs> that would be for my coders who are on the coastlines <laughs> that would have something like that, uh, probably out in California, maybe, um, or maybe even in the Gulf. I don't know, you know, Florida, you know, y'all, y'all would have that, or in Florida or even in like Louisiana, y'all would have contact with um, alligators. You know, <laughs> that would be really interesting. Bitten by an alligator, mm, that would be horrible. But that that's one of those things that y'all have, you know. Uh, Misty, oh, y'all are really serious about those codes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. You get some really interesting ones, which I think that's probably part of my love of injury coding is just how specific that it can get. Um, I've gone back and forth with my auditor before about contact with the dog, you know, uh, because the, I mean, when you have like a situation where a patient falls and it's like due to contact with the dog, you know what I mean? So it's, it, it gets very, <laughs> very intense, very, very specific, you know, uh, bitten by a pig, parrot, chicken, duck. Yes. You can have those. It is very interesting. Um, but those pigs, pigs will bite. I, I have seen that on Lester's channel. Pigs will bite. So, um, uh, what was her name? Pig Trudy. Uh, she has nipped before um, at uh, some of the other animals. But when they start nipping at each other, sometimes, you know, they, I mean, they just get nipped too. Um by the goats and stuff like that, like Jamie, and not Jamie, but uh, Lester. Oh yeah, they. I, I can imagine how many times if they've had to go <laughs> to the doctor um, for a bite, you know, how many times that they would, you know, be said, okay, well, I got this. <laughs> uh, it hurts, been bitten by one. Uh, by a pig? You've been bitten by a pig or a goat? And uh, parrots, ugh, something with birds. So my friend had a bird. And she always had me babysit this bird when she was out. Some birds are okay. This this bird was a macaw, so it was very annoying. I didn't like that bird, you know. <laughs> that was the one bird I did not like. Uh, because parrots are okay, but again, 
They're just kind of messy. Mm -hmm. Macaws are very messy. And this one, it talked too. It's talked and screeched. And I was like, oh, oh my gosh, you know, but messy bird. <sighs> yeah. Um, I used to take care of a pig farm. Oh, okay. So you know all about pigs. Um, they also rescued this one named Lola. And Lola was used to being in the house because they bought her as a, a potbelly pig as a baby and she as she started getting bigger she started chewing holes in the wall and chewing up the furniture so they were like well no, she needs to be on a farm so they asked lester if they could bring her well lester said okay because he saw the pictures and he's like he, he loves pigs and he can't resist pigs so they bought lola and so of course lola she's kind of scared at first and they put her in quarantine so they had her in one of the horse stalls and and when they started you know bringing her around with the other animals you all you see is her tail just wagging i mean she is just a happy happy pig i mean because she's got mud to play in and she's they give her uh sweet tea to drink and she gets all kinds of snacks and um none of the other animals i think because they know she's a house pig that she's not really accepted right now uh they're still kind of trying to transition her with the other animals uh but she snuck into um, the bull, they have a bull named Tex. This is a Texas show. <laughs> they have a bull named Tex. And so she snuck into his pasture and she started eating the food that he had left over, you know, cause he didn't want it. And so all you see was her tail <laughs> wagging. It was the cutest thing. He's like, baby, get out of there. <laughs> uh, pigs are very destructive animals, but they can be so sweet. They are my favorite farm animal. Yes, they are really sweet and very smart. Pigs are really smart. I mean, cute too. Oh, Charlotte's Web. Yes, yes, very cute. Um, but that's one of the things that you'll discover. You'll discover your, uh, look for those down, those downtime outlets. And that is one of the, my favorite ones that I would have to say. <laughs> um, BK says, pigs are scary. Uh, I was doing security and I was in the company vehicle. I guess it smelled my lunch. I only had a PB and J and before I knew it, the pig was ramming the side of the vehicle. What was in that sandwich? Oh my goodness. <laughs> but if the pig is hungry, I mean, that's probably what the problem was, you know? Um, but yeah, they can get very aggressive. You should see them when, um, Lester shows when they're, he's feeding them. Oh yeah. They get very aggressive with each other. <laughs> uh, BK, I threw my sandwich and took off. The pig ate it and then started following me. <laughs> well, I mean, you had a good sandwich. You wanted to know if there was more, <laughs> but that was scary because again, they're quite big and they can knock you over, you know? Um, and it doesn't take much because even though they're on these little legs, you know, <laughs> and they can cause destruction. Yes. Uh, Sarah, oh, too funny. I can never turn your back on some, you can never turn your back on some of them. Uh, BK, I had a 15 inch dent in the side of the car. Wow. I mean, but when you think about it, I mean, they're like huge, you know, um, when pig Trudy got to the farm, I think he said that she was eight pounds and then in a week she had gone up to 12 pounds. So, I mean, and they like oatmeal and they fight over that oatmeal and he tried to only feed them oatmeal once a week and they were not having it. They wanted it more. So <laughs> he, people started sending in oatmeal and now they have it on the regular. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I can imagine 15 inch dent. Yeah, that pig wanted that sandwich and whatever else you had, <laughs> whatever other snacks you had, that would have been fine with them. <laughs> uh, let's see. But that's where those uh, those entry codes get very interesting, too. Um, make sure that you're reviewing your ICD-10 CM uh, external cause codes um, to get better acquainted with them, get better acquainted with the options that you have. Uh, I've suggested that before I did a whole video on how to study for the external causes and I would recommend that you know whether you are studying inpatient or outpatient is to make sure that you you know your external causes getting strong excuse me with 
injury coding is only going to benefit you. Why? Because you can work in the ER, which is where a lot of uh, times they're, they are needing medical coders is in the ER. <laughs> you can work for urgent care, again, uh, a place where lots of people who get injured or bitten by farm animals will end up. So, you know, that is something that uh, it's beneficial to you when you understand and know how to code injuries, okay? And you really get into those depths of, okay, uh, well, the patient didn't just fall, they tripped and fell. So it wouldn't be unspecified fall because we knew they, they we know that they tripped and fell. So again, same level, fall on the same level due to trip and fall, okay? Was this involving water? Were they getting out of the bathtub? It's, it's the detail, guys. And then the, the code gets more specific each, each time. So that is something that when you're studying those injury codes and the diagnoses and things like that, it's just better for you all the way around. <laughs> um, Sarah, I've watched them tip over grain silos. Now, that does not surprise me. <laughs> BK, dispatch thought I was joking. Officer in distress. <laughs> they thought I was oh, joking until they saw the dent. Well, yeah. <laughs> uh, Misty, never a dull moment working in the ER. Well, think about it. You have everything in the ER, right? You have mom and baby. You have injuries. You have a uh, heart. You have the head, like neuro, like strokes and things like that. Yeah, you've got everything going on in the ER. You've got um, anything and everything that you could possibly think of, you got coming through the ER. I mean, you really gotta hand it to those ER folks that, you know, yeah, they deal with a lot and they see a lot. <laughs> yeah, uh, BK, exactly. I love working in the ER. <laughs> it never gets dull, for sure. Um, and, you know, that that does get interesting, too. When you start coding for that, that does get very interesting. And Ms. D says, exactly. So, <laughs> that's funny, officer in distress. <laughs> yeah, I'm getting attacked by a pig. They're like, what? A pig? <laughs> like, what kind of joke is that? And then they see, yeah, that would be a pig, you know. But. Yeah, those, those pigs are something else. But it's so cute and so relaxing to watch but that's just what I think anyway <laughs> um, but yeah that's that's what I recommend look for those fun moments in coding somebody was asking me that the other day like how do you find an interesting position in medical coding your position that you get in is going to be what you make of it let's just be honest right it's, it is what you make of it and if you are finding yourself like in a in a clinic that has injuries and you're looking at the documentation and you can see all these adventures that these patients come in with <laughs> and you're coding it out, that's like one of the best things, you know, that you can actually get that coded, you know. Um, and when you see the codes as they come out and you can start to reveal the story in your head based on the codes that you selected, that's awesome. <laughs> that really is awesome. Hi, Jerry. Thank you for the blue heart. Hi, Blue. I'm late. I'll have to watch tomorrow. Well, you're going to have a pretty interesting show to watch tomorrow. <laughs> uh, but we did talk about study tips and farm animals. <laughs> what a way to change it up, right? I'm just saying. <laughs> um, Sarah, thank you, Blue. Always learning something from your videos. Till next time is dinner time. Ooh. Have a good dinner, and thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for sharing, and I will see you all tomorrow. Or, Sarah. <laughs> um, Jerry. <laughs> yes, we are talking about farm animals just now. And uh, But study tips, importantly, study tips. We were talking about study tips, so it wasn't a complete, well, you know, what did she, did she get off subject? I... I did a little bit, but it, it wasn't it wasn't um, it, it wasn't on purpose. Okay, it was just so that I, I could share how I uh, take my breaks and downtime and things like that. So, you know. Uh, but on that note, uh, does anybody else have anything else before I wrap it up? Because we've gone on pretty good, pretty good. It's been a pretty good show tonight, uh, especially when I start talking about farm animals. <laughs> 
Uh, but I will leave the, the link to the I'm a Survivor uh, Sanctuary uh, channel in my description box when I update this video. So that way you guys can watch the show too because it's it's awesome and, and you know I, I've been hooked on watching the shows ever since. <laughs> uh, but because it's just funny. It's just people being themselves and you know being with the animals and I think it's a good time anyway. <laughs> Uh, my, uh, my rates will be in the description box as well uh, for that. Uh, when is ICD-11 going to be released? Eight years? Eight or nine years from now? So we are, like, still a long way from it. Um, ICD-11 kicked in for the places that were already ready for it. Uh, if you don't know, we are behind the times, and we've been behind the times so many for so many years and we're still behind the times there's countries that are way ahead of us when it comes to this and they're already in icd 11 okay uh we are just barely in icd 10. <laughs> so if for us to get into to make the switch from icd 9 to icd 10 uh back in 2015 we had went through so many years of delays we had went through years of delays um from from lobbyists and from different people um, that were were causing the, the thing to stop and then um, some some doctors were being concerned because <clears throat> they weren't sure that you know financially they were going to be able to get paid and everything because um, you know what about this changeover and these you know these people are still trying to get um, acquainted with this different way of coding <clears throat> but what was so good is that we were getting a lot of the training a year ahead of time so um, I say all that to say that when we do hit ICD-11, we will be being trained about a year out. And um, for us, when we made the switch to ICD-10, um, I had actually gotten the training starting a year out prior. And, you know, it, I mean, it really did, we did transition quite well. Uh, they did think that they were going to have to bring in a lot of like overseas coders to kind of like help bridge that gap, but they didn't. And it, eventually they didn't have to because everybody was picking up ICD-10 um, coding pretty well. And I, and then that has a huge credit of that has to go to the program people who made those programs to design those to teach um, ICD-10. So that worked out really well. I think when we do go to <clears throat> ICD-11, that they will uh, do the same thing. They will have that same protocol in place. Um, and we'll be able to make that transition smoothly then as well. Uh, but the thing that concerns me in the future is that, um, or the thing not concerns me, but the thing that I would hope in the future is that more of these uh, people that are going to be interested into getting into medical coding really understand that it's not just about the money. Medical coding is not just about the money that you can make. But it is more about understanding what you're doing. You know, a lot of people will say, oh, they're threatening. Oh, well, you know, AI will take over. Again, you have to get, in order for AI to work, everybody would have to be a robot because everybody would have to fall into this, you know, same thing, same algorithm and same thing all the time. And it's impossible because everybody has a different medical history. So when you hear this garbage about, oh, it's going to take over, they've been threatening that since the early 2000s, probably since the 90s, okay? Uh, so again, you know, when you think about the expense that it's going to have to endure, not only that, the updates that are going to have to go on every year, and and then the, the, the coding rules and everything else that update as well. So this thing would have to literally be able to be designed to read the provider's mind. And again, the provider's not going to be documented in the same way every single day either. And so that's the thing I wish people would understand. And if they didn't understand it, if they would just be quiet about it. Because if you don't know what you're talking about, you shouldn't be talking about it. And so that's the thing. You know, when people, and people will run around saying that, oh yeah, AI you, you need to understand what medical coding is before you can say anything about AI. And while there has been improvements and we have used technology to help us with coding, like with encoders, right? Because a lot of people can't even use their books anymore. And that 
is a shame. You should never, even as a veteran medical coder, don't, don't be, don't do what I did, which was get away from using the book. I had gotten so dependent on the encoder. And when you get dependent on the encoder, you start to lose your skill in the book. And I saw how that affected me when I started to study again. So that is one thing that if you are a veteran medical coder, if, even if you've been in a, me, uh, a medical coder for a short time, still make sure that you know how to use your book and be able to navigate that book and never lose that skill. Never lose your speed because it's only going to hurt you. Uh, because again, when you think about, you know, in the future, hopefully people will understand that medical terminology and anatomy and pathophysiology are so important. Do I wish sometimes that they had those prerequisites like you absolutely have to have this? Yes. Uh, but at the same time, I know there are students out there that are like me that can learn this on their own. So that's where it's just like, <laughs> what do you do? What do you do there? But again, I just, I hope that, you know, there aren't these, you know, schools that try to cheat people. And, you know, I hope there's none of that, but there's always going to be that. There's always going to be some slick talker and always going to take advantage of somebody and just say all the things, the right things that they want so that the people can sign up for their program. And I don't think that that's right, you know, uh, because I think that that puts people into the field that uh, would rather probably not be in the field, but then they're in it and they don't like it and it shows in their work. You know. <laughs> um, Misty says, exciting show tonight. Thank you so much for the enlightening of codes. Have a great evening, y'all. You too, Misty. Thank you so much. Um, Rita, coding is like science. Yes, Justin. Oh, look, it's Justin. <laughs> yeah, I'm still working on a HEMAS program. I hope it ends well. And blue and long time no see. Exactly. I was just saying the other day, I was like, I haven't seen him. It's like, hmm. But the the universe answered my question. There you are. <laughs> and you appear, you know, so that is really cool. I'm I'm hoping that your program is going well. Uh I know of a few other people that have told me that they're going through the program as well too themselves. Um, so just stick with it. Whatever you do, stick with it. Uh, but yes. Uh, it is, it is, it is because we have to know what doctors know while never having gone to medical school. Uh, Justin, been busy with a lot of medical coding that I study after work and can't make it. <laughs> well, I'm glad you made it today. It's, it's good that you popped up and you, you're here, you know, I still got you in mind for tutoring. Well, good, good. I'm glad. Uh, because again, when you get to that point, you know, it's important to have good guidance, especially when you are doing this by yourself, you know, when you don't know, or if you don't understand, that's the time to be like, okay, <laughs> I need help. <laughs> and, you know, we'll, we'll go from there. So, but good to see you. Good to see you. If you ever catch up on any of the videos, if you catch up on this one tonight, I was talking about farm animals earlier, but, but we did segue into external cause coding. So, you know, <laughs> it makes for an interesting subject. <laughs> I will say that. Uh, so anyway, uh, if you have any requests for shows, please let me know in the comments, uh, so that we, we can, um, if they're a lot of the same, I will probably try to do a show. Uh, if it is a basic question, you could check my other videos and see. Um, if there's something that covers that topic that you're asking about, because a lot of times if it is a really basic question, uh, there's, there's a lot of those videos, uh, on my channel that will answer a lot of those basic questions, like where to start, how to get started and that kind of thing. So, um, but I'm going to go ahead and wrap this one up. If anyone else has anything else, <laughs> uh, if you haven't had a chance to subscribe already, I hope that you do. Uh, like this, share this, join me on Facebook or whatever they're going to change their name to pretty soon. <laughs> uh, I'm on there at Medical Coding with Blue right now. Uh, it is Facebook still. Uh, somebody said, isn't it, did they change their name? I don't know. <laughs> I'm just on Facebook. So, uh, and I'm also on LinkedIn and I'm also on Instagram at Medical Coding with Blue. So I'm going to go ahead and wrap this one up. Thank you guys so much for joining me and I will see y'all on the next episode. Bye.